Okay, so let's get it started. Uh, thank you all for coming uh, to this talk uh, entitled Implementing Microservices Tracing with Spring Cloud and Zipkin. Uh, so before we may go to the main topic, uh, I'm going to say just a few words about myself. So my name is Marcin Grzejszczak. I come from a distant country called Poland, uh, Warsaw. Uh, my surname is impossible to pronounce. So, yeah. so if you wanna if you wanna see my Twitter handle, go to my blog to muchcoding.com and fetch the Twitter handle from there. It's gonna be easier. I'm uh, I'm working at Spring Cloud at Pivotal. Uh, who's using Spring Cloud? Okay, quite a few people. And who's using either of these libraries? Sluf. Who's using Sluf? Okay, one person. Contracts? Nobody. Cool. And pipelines? Even less. So you have like options to start using them. So I'm the lead on those projects. Yeah. Uh, so what's on the agenda? First, we're going to talk about what distributed tracing is. Uh, then I will show you how to correlate logs with Spring Cloud Sluf and why should we consider doing that. And then I'm going to show you how to visualize latency with Sluf and the project called Zipkin. Uh, today was a very long day, so I'm more than certain that the demos I have will not work. But, <laughs> but, mo but if they don't, I'm going to play a video of this talk where they do, maybe. <laughs> We're going to do it like this. And there's a warning. There's a couple of unfunny memes. So at least, I mean, drink more beer, and then they're going to be funny, maybe. Uh, or at least pretend that they're funny, because I'm going to be sad if you don't. <laughs> OK, so we have an ordinary system. Can you see? Yep. Okay. Yep. If not, look here. Uh, so we have an ordinary system, like right? service one is calling service two, and that guy is calling service three and service four. So we can assume a situation where we have a UI thing that is calling the backend apps, right? So everything is really cool. So we have a user, and it's clicking around, and, and it, the hundreds are flowing around, so things are good, right? But everything is awesome until it's not. So we have another case where we have the user, He's clicking around, he gets a you know, 500 screen of death, and he gets really angry. And that's a valid reason, because the user has paid for the software. So there's a table flip, because uh, a lot of money has been spent, and the software is not working. So what happens is that this user is calling our, uh, let's say, uh, support line and says swear words uh, that the thing is not working. So the second line of support is calling us, or the, third one, the first one saying, what did you do? And then we have to like, dive into this big pile of code that has been written for ages and has like 10,000 lines to find what the reason for this exception is, right? But it's not really that nice, because believe it or not, I lied to you. Your systems don't look like this. They look more like this. So behind every service, there are a, a lot of machines flowing around. So we have, you have scaled your apps, you have different instances of different, on different machines. And then the question to you is, on which server or instance was the exception from? Right? And there was one guy with whom I worked who said, no problem. I'm going to SSH every single machine, tail the logs, and grab for error. Right? Imagine the screen like divided into those little terminals to grab and tail, like tail and grab. I mean, maybe you can do that. I'm not saying, I mean, it's better this than nothing, but there are better solutions to this. So the question is how to find all logs from all instances uh, that correspond to that one particular business action, right? That flew through all the system. And the answer is distributed tracing. So to understand that, we need to understand these five terms, which are span, trace, baggage, logs, and tags. Let's start with the first three. What is a span? A span is a basic unit of work. So let's say when, you're, when you have an RPC, that is a span. What are the, let's say, technicalities of spans? Spans are started and stopped. That means they have a duration. They keep track of the timing information. So once you create a span, you have to stop it at some point in the future, because it's a bounded operation. 
a span has, has a parent and can have multiple children. All spans have unique span IDs, right? So every single span that you create, like a span spawns another span, both have different IDs. But this hierarchy of spans share a trace ID, right? So if you have span that spawns a span that spawns yet another span, they have unique span IDs, but they share a trace ID. You'll see that in a second in a, in a picture. So what is a trace? Trace is a set of spans forming a tree-like structure. So if you run, let's say that we're running a bookstore. And in order to get the book, like somebody sends a request, asks us for a list of available books, and we need to send three requests to get this list of available books. So the, the whole business action, so all four calls, will share a trace ID. But each hop will be a separate span. Right? So trace is retrieving the list of all books, regardless of how many requests were sent. And assuming that there were three requests, each of those hops, each of those requests, is a separate span. All of them forming one trace. Now baggage is something that we support from Sleuth 1 to 0. Uh, so you can set some key values, right? like, like a map. Uh, and that map gets propagated between network boundaries. So if in like service A is calling B and B is calling C, if in service A you set the baggage, some key value pair, we will propagate it to every subsequent service. So it's accessible in every app within the duration of the trace, and it works both for HTTP and messaging, message-based communication. And this is important if you try to serialize some beans or, I don't know, a lot of data because you want to, I don't know, deserialize it 15 services later, you can do that, but it's not the best of ideas because if you put a lot of stuff in the baggage, you start getting great latency because it starts to wait, right? So now, let's say that we have this service one and a request comes in and there was no trace or no span ID. Like, Fresh, first start. Now service one, in service one we create a, I mean you can't see any colors, so this is like green or something. A trace ID is set to X and span ID is set to A. In fact, these are 128 bit numbers, but let's for simplicity's sake give some letters to it. So we have trace ID X and span ID A. Now service one will call service two. So a new span is created, service is span ID B, but the trace ID is X all the time, like the same one. And we set a baggage here. So when service two receives that, you can see that it has the same ID of a span. That's because it's an RPC. So you have a span of, on both sides. Here you can see that we have something called client send, and here we have something called server received. You'll see what that is later. But it's, let's say that we're stamping the sort of information on the span at certain time, uh, in certain time, right? So at this time, we sent the request, and at that time, we received that. Now, service two does some work. So span ID uh, with ID C is created, and trace ID is still X, the same trace ID. And we're sending a request from service two to service three. So yeah, the same thing. New span with ID D and span ID E. And we won't go like further on because it's boring. We have to start going back. So we have closed this span, and now we're sending the response back. So again, the same color, span ID D has client sent, server received. Server sent, so now guess what's going to happen? Anybody takes a guess? Yeah, client received. You can grab yourself a beer or something. You want it. So this is the full cycle of RPC, right? So client send, server received, service send, client received. Now the same thing happens here in service four. So we have yet another span. The trace ID is X all the time. And we go back, go back, go back. So we have completed the whole flow. So assuming that this is the, let's say, business operation, so that for the whole time of having this business operation, trace ID is the same. There are different spans and they have unique IDs. Does it make any sense? Okay. 
This is the uh, flow of, um, this is the parent span relationship. So the first span has no parent, so this is the root span. And then span B has parent A, span C has parent B, and span uh, C has two children, D and F. So you have a, a tree-like structure, right? So now one can say, is it that simple? Because I'm saying, yeah, you pass the tracing information, you pass the headers, and is it that simple? Believe me, it's not. Because context propagation as such is very difficult. Imagine that you have some sort of information that you would like to pass between stuff like different libraries, for example, different libraries to send requests, right? Because how do we pass uh, tracing context? In HTTP headers. So now you have REST template, you have Fain, for instance, and it has to work out of the box. You have to pass this. What about threads? You start a new thread. How do you pass information to the new thread? What about asynchronous communication? Again, right? You have a future somewhere, so it's going to be executed by some, another, like some thread from a thread pool. Or executor service. How do you ensure that the context is propagated? Because if you, have, if you miss a spot, suddenly you have two traces, two separate traces, even though you should have one. And then you take a look at the, at the graph of calls, and some things are wrong. So that, that was me often when trying to uh, instrument libraries. Especially, I had a lot of problems with Fane for some reasons. And each time I think that the thing was fixed, somebody files an issue that new thing doesn't work with Fane. So yeah, but I'm trying to fix it fast. OK, so let's come back to our problem. Uh, yeah, so sorry, one more thing. So in Spring Cloud Sleuth, what we take care of is passing uh, tracing information, tracing context between stuff like Hystrix, which itself is a, is a nightmare, so to say, because it's working with threads like all the time. Eric's Java, we kind of support this. Uh, we will have much better support for Reactor. With Eric's Java and Reactor, there, there is a like, <laughs> it's very interesting because one thing is that um, this processing happens in different threads. And we're quite good at passing stuff between threads. But in these libraries, you also have thread stealing, work stealing. So sometimes you start <laughs> processing in one thread and finishing the other. But you have, yeah, in the meantime, we have lost the context. Right? So we are working on changing Reactor, for instance, to pass context in a different way. REST template, Fane, messaging with Spring integration, Zool, there's a bunch of libraries. You can check out the docs that we support out of the, out of the box. So if you don't do anything unexpected, and I haven't done any bugs, and if it's not Fane, then it should work perfectly. So check the docs for more info. Now, who is in the logs setting the thread name? One person, two people. So the rest of you in the logs, or three, when you're logging in your app, like creating logs of your application, you're not set, like providing the name of the thread that is doing the computations. If you're not doing that, you're virtually blind when you're doing parallel processing or like putting something in an asynchronous manner. You have absolutely no idea where the log comes from. So if you're using Spring Boot, we set the logging format for you so it contains the, the thread name. And with Sleuth, sorry, with, with Sleuth, we are extending this uh, logging format in, even further to, to contain some tracing information. So if you're not doing that, like, the, the, first, like the, the first thing you should be doing tomorrow is change the logging format to contain name of the thread. Otherwise, you're virtually blind. I mean, if you're doing, uh, if you haven't done a single asynchronous processing, then you have, don't have a problem, right? But it would be like, quite beneficial to know from which thread uh, the log is, comes from. OK, so let's aggregate the logs. SSHing to machines is a solution, but let's find something better. We can aggregate the logs instead of like, doing this SSH. What does it mean, aggregate the logs? So if you're using Cloud Foundry, there is a tool over there called Logregator. So if you're running the apps, it's piping all the logs from all the apps and streaming it in a single place. 
So then you can just take the logs from that particular place, right? But if you're not using Cloud Foundry, you can use something called ELK, E-L-K. Who knows? Elasticsearch Log Stash Kibana. OK, quite a few people. So for those who don't know, you can have a process. I mean, there are different ways of solving this, but let us focus on this one. So in a, on every server where you're running your apps, you can have a process called Logstash for Warder. Now it's called Filebeat, from what I'm, uh, I remember, that takes your logs and sends them away to, uh, to Logstash. Logstash is a tool that basically takes an input, processes it, and puts it to an output. So I described like 95% of applications in the world. But in this case, it takes the logs, cuts them into pieces, and stores them in Elasticsearch, so the database. So ELK, Logstash, is doing that what I said. Elasticsearch is a database, and Kibana is the UI over Elasticsearch to visualize the logs. We're going to do de a demo in a sec with that, so don't worry. Now, uh, so how can you add Spring Cloud Sleuth uh, with Maven in order, to, in order to profit from the log correlation? So this is a fresh thing. I think it was released yesterday. So the latest Dalston release train. So you add the Spring Cloud dependencies with Dalston SR2. SR1. Sorry, I'm going to fix it. <laughs> SR1. SR1. Uh, and then you provide Spring Cloud Starter Sleuth. So that way, if you add it, we add all the instrumentation. So basically, you don't have to do anything. So now, uh, we have those four services. So let's go back to this main topic. So we had a user, and an exception was thrown, and the user is unhappy. We're losing money, and people want to fire us. So we have to like, do something about this. So this is the case. A request comes in to the start endpoint. We set some baggage there. Uh, then we send a request to service two, and we go back. Like service three is going to respond with hello from service three. Service four is going to respond hello from service four, and we present the response like back to the user. So this is the positive scenario. So let's say that everything is working fine. And there's going to be another uh, case with that service one has a spe special endpoint that all of our, your applications have, which is read timeout which will call service two. And now I think there's going to be like the maximum I can do with animations in Google Slides. That's it. <laughs> so service two is going to call a non-existing thing, I guess. So an exception will be thrown, and we have a boom. So this is the second case, so the 500 scenario. OK, so let's check out some stuff. So uh, say hello to Kibana. This is how it looks like. Uh, wait a sec. So here, what you see, those pipes, those, those bars, are actually logs within time. So like at 6 AM, oh, this is very interesting. So I'm not really good at configuring Kibana. And this is the first time in my career that I'm doing a talk not in my original time zone. So this is not 6 a.m. I've executed that, like I think, 30 minutes ago. That's why, for some reason, the logs are shifted, <laughs> OK? Uh, so when, I, um, when I'm going to execute another request at the moment, we're going to see it somewhere over here, not, not like 15 minutes ago, right? Sorry for that. So uh, what you can see here are columns related to logs. So let me first fire a request, maybe. So I'm going to go to localhost 8081 start, right? I'm going here, and we have uh, the proper response, right? Hello from service 2, response from service 3, blah, blah, blah. So if we go to the, to the logs, you will actually see the log in the, for oh, let's take this one the log in a format that you should be using in your production code, or at least part of this. So you have the time, the severity, the name of the app, trace ID, span ID, the process ID, that is not important for the time being. When I was first looking at the, at the logging format, I was asking, what are those three bars? 
So there are nothing, basically. There are just three bars. So it's just to <laughs> separate the sections. And this is very important, the thing that is cut. This is the name of the thread. So if you have multiple things processed at a time, you know from which threads they come. This is the name of the class and the message, right? Hello from service one, calling service two, etc. So the very same thing right now should be visible. Whoa. Over here, if I do uh, like out of refresh, maybe. OK, that's interesting. I'm going to pick this trace ID. OK. And we're going to search for that. Most likely, nothing will work. I told you that it's because of the demo gods. OK, yeah, refresh it. Uh, yeah, but I'm looking for something else. Uh, paste. Of course. Yeah. Last. That's unfortunate. I knew this was going to happen. OK, let's pick the one that works. No, no, I'm, I'm searching for a particular trace, right, with a, with a proper name. So yeah, let's, let's keep with this one. Uh, OK, so I'm searching right now for all logs that have the, the, like a given uh, ID of trace, which means that it's going to show me all the logs from all services that share the same ID. So right now, if I click on time, OK, so I right now have put it in a chronological order. So if you go down, you can see service one was first, then it was service two, then service three, and service four, and the last one should be service one. So that's the chronological order. We can actually, uh, if I remember, I can do, there's something wrong with the UI here, and, and severity info. Info. I guess it's like this. Yay. So right now we're going to have le like less noise. So imagine the, how powerful it is when, because right now I executed those four services on my local machine, so this is not really that extremely interesting. But imagine getting those services, those logs from different machines, right? So right now we can go over the logs and see that I was setting some baggage, I was calling service to, there is like foobar somewhere, whatever, right? So I can, I can see uh, a lot of stuff going on around here, which is really cool, right? So we are, uh, it's much easier for us to debug the issues because we don't have to like search where a particular log took place in terms of an exception, right? So I can right now try to find the, the log with, well, yeah with severity, severity, oh, come on, severity error. OK, so let me find now the trace ID, trace, oh, trace. I mean, it was here in, like a moment ago. Once again, severity error. Once again, trace. Oh, OK, I, I, I had to make a typo or something. So right now, we can see the case with an error, right? So right, we can see the, the particular log where an exception occurred while trying to send a request to service two. So I have immediately found the log that, uh, like, like, um, which was created due to an exception. And I can replicate the whole flow of messages that led to this particular exception. Right, so uh, in a standard way, what you would do, you would search for a log, SSH to the machine, less, find an exception, and then pray that those logs before were related to this particular issue. But if you're not even having the thread name, you don't really know. And this is only on one machine. So you have absolutely no idea on, like, from different processes what resulted in this exception. And here, you have it in one place, out of the box. And in new versions of Kibana, from what I remember, you can even create some sort of alerting 
when there is an, like a log with a, an error, just, I don't know, send a message or do something. So who thinks it's cool? Yay. So I'm going to, like, cheers. OK. Another of you. OK. I see your polyglot, like German, Polish. <laughs> You're good. So uh, this is a screen from Logregator. You basically can't see anything. But believe me, this is exactly the same log. But also, you can uh, have an information about like, uh, which app it is and which instance, something like this. And this is the screen from Kibana if the demo wouldn't work, but it worked, so yeah. OK, that was a very simple scenario. Because an exception was thrown, so the user just saw that. You have a stack trace when an exception is thrown, right? You will have some sort of information that something went wrong. So we found it. We're the heroes. We're not going to get fired. But mean, in the meantime, it turns out the system is slow. right? So if there is a user. He's clicking around. Then he's pissed off. And then he gets a kitten. Because it takes a lot of time. And now it's a problem, because you won't see that in the logs. There's no exception. So which one is it? Which service? Which service is, from? It is slow? And which machine? How can you measure that? So the one way to do that is logging events. So we already mentioned some events. You have client send, which means the client has made a request, right? You have server received, which means that the server side has received a request and is going to start processing that request. Then you have server send, which means, OK, I completed processing the request. There you go. There's the response. And client received. So he, the client has successfully received the response from the server side. So let's start playing like in high school with time. So let's say that client send took place at t equals 0 milliseconds. Now request was sent, and server received was stamped on a span at t equal 100 milliseconds. Then we have server sent at 300 milliseconds, and client received at 450 milliseconds. Make sense? Whatever. What are the conclusions? The request started at t equals 0. Fair enough. It took 450 milliseconds for the client to receive the response, right? 400. True. Server side has received the request at T100. Sure. The request needed like 200 milliseconds to be processed on the, on the uh, server side. Because this minus this is 200. So why is there a delay between sending and receiving? Who knows the answer? The server is what? Exactly, the server is on the moon, so we have latency of network, right? Who is familiar with this? OK, not that many, so you should read that. Eight fallacies of distributed computing. So these are eight statements that people assume true in terms of network computing, and they are absolutely false. Let's focus on the two. The network is reliable, and let's focus exactly on the second one. Latency is zero which means that you assume that you send a request and it's immediately retrieved, which is false. So to calculate the latency, we need to take into account those logs and tags, which are also known as annotations and binary annotations. What is a log? Log represents an event that happened in time. That's it. So every span can have zero or more logs. Each log has a name, which has a timestamp. That's it. For example, client send. And an event should have a stable name, like a notable event, uh, like notable time for an event. So if you check out something called performance timing from Mozilla, uh, they have like good samples of uh, event names. For example, navigation start in, in terms of uh, um, page navigation, right? So navigation start, unload event start, unload event end. These are notable events that happen in your system. So the main logs. Client sent, we said. Client has made a request, the span was started. Server received, the server side got the request. And now if we take a pencil and start cal calculating, SR 
minus CS, so server received minus client sent, this is network lat latency. So it's that, how much we had to wait for the request to appear on the server side. Now, server send, we have completed processing the request. So server sent minus server received, it's how much time we spent on processing the request. So if somebody says the, the system is slow, now we have already two options. Is this slow or is this slow, right? Client received. So we have successfully received the response from the server side. Now, CR minus CS, latency on the response. So the first thing that can be slow. And uh, CR minus, um, uh, sorry, I said CR minus CS, it's time needed to like, go through the whole flow. And CR minus SS is network lat latency, in this case is 150 milliseconds, for instance, right? So these were logs. Now tags, what are tags? So it's a key value pair. So I told you about baggage, which is a key value pair that goes beyond, like, over network uh, boundaries. So tag is exactly the same case, but it's not going via network boundaries. So every span can have uh, zero or more tags. They don't have a timestamp, it's just a key value pair. And there are some default tags in Sleuf. So for example, if uh, you're sending a message, then we're providing message slash payload size tag. It's, there's no sense to put it over the network boundary because it's related to this, this particular message. HTTP method, so the, the request was received. What was the, or like, I'm sorry, the message was sent. What was the message? Uh, the, the, sorry, the method of this HTTP message. Or if you're using Hystrix, what's the command key? We have quite a few of those. Okay, so now we know how to calculate the latency. So what will you do? Will you put it in the logs? That's not really efficient. You won't see much. So how can you visualize latency in a distributed system? The answer is Zipkin. Zipkin is a project uh, under Open Tracing, Open Zipkin uh, initiative on, um, on GitHub. So if you go to GitHub to the Open Tracing organization, there is Zipkin over there. So how does it work? We have our applications, right? They create spans. And I mentioned at some point that you have to close the span. What does it mean that you have to close the span? Once you close the span, it gets sent in a separate thread in a non-blocking manner, a non, non, uh, let's say, it doesn't produce any latency for your system. It's a separate thread, and a span gets sent to something called a collector. It's, a, it's an app from Zipkin that receives the span and stores the span information in the database. And you have a UI which you can query in order to get all the tracing information. So it looks like this. Uh, if you go to a web page and press F12, I guess, I don't know how it's on Mac, to see the flow, uh, how much time you needed for CSS to download, to download some images. So now imagine the same with services in a distributed system. So here you can see that this particular re request, it's exactly the same request I've been, like the, the, the flow that I've been showing you with logs and from the very beginning in, in, uh, uh, like in the slides. So it took 1.1 second to process, like the whole uh, flow, the whole trace. There were four services involved. And we started with service one. It got a request to HTTP method called start, the start endpoint. Then service one called service two at the full endpoint. And you can see that service three and service four are the, are the same level. So it means that service two calls service three and then calls service four. And it took one second for service two to finish its job. Service three was 300 milliseconds. Service four took 400 milliseconds, for example. Right, this is Zipkin. So how can you integrate with Sylph and Zipkin? Since we, like the first thing that has to be done is that you have to pass the context, like propagate the context between threads, network boundaries, etc. So you have to use Sleuth to profit from, uh, profit from Zipkin. And when you're closing span, we send the spans to Zipkin in either of those ways. One is via HTTP, 
then you have to add some spring out to the Zipkin thing, or via messaging. So via spring out to the stream. And obviously, the spring, this collector from Zipkin can be run as a boot app. So you annotate one annotation, you add the dependency uh, to get the, um, to make it become a collector. And if you add a UI dependency to it, your collector can also be your UI. So you can easily scale the UI. So how do you add it? Oh, here I put it properly. You add the Dalston SR1, release train, and to have the Zipkin via HTTP, you add Spring Cloud Starter Zipkin. That's it. And I should say, hold it. If I have billion services, and they emit gazillion of spans, will I not kill Zipkin? Imagine how many spans are flowing, right? So the answer is, it depends. As every consultant would say, now you should ask, on what? So it depends whether you trace or not. So there is something called sampling. And by default, like let, let's, let's uh, define the things properly. If you're using Spring Cloud Sleuth, we propagate tracing context and put tracing information in the logs always. Always, right? But if you integrate with Zipkin, you can introduce sampling. That way, you send every tenth trace to Zipkin, right? In the logs, everything is traced, but only the tenth trace is sent to Zipkin. That way, you will not kill Zipkin. And primarily, the reason behind Zipkin is to, um, let's say, fix and, and, and debug repetitive latency issues, right? So if you had, like for an hour, some problems in your system, then you will see that every 10th request has this, has this problem. If for 1 million requests, five are slow, and you won't catch it in this 10%, most likely it doesn't matter, right? If it does matter for you, you can increase the sampling to 100%, and then you will send all spans, all, all uh, traces to Zipkin. So it's very easy, you just change this property to one zero and that's it. Or you can implement your own sampler if you need something more complex. So now I'm gonna be doing a demo that I'm 100% sure is not gonna work. So this was our flow. And right now I'm going to create a branded, like specially for you, Toronto service that will send a request to the start service. And I'm going to use Zipkin and Sleuth to work with that, OK? OK. By the way, who has seen Josh Long's talks? Josh Long, Josh Long, OK, quite a few people. So for those who don't know Josh Long, you should know this like, place anyways. It's called start.spring.io. So Josh says, I mean, he's like the doctor because he's saying that when your children are restless, you should go to start.spring.io and generate a Spring Boot project. Or if you're unhappy, you should do it. So basically, this is a place where you can define your dependencies, provide some group IDs and stuff, and automatically your project will be generated and you can just import it into your IDE. Actually, I don't know if IntelliJ, but in Eclipse, for sure, you, can, you have a plugin to even click it in your IDE that is going to automatically generate a project for you. In IntelliJ? Well, I've never done this. So, but you need a plugin or something? No. Oh, I didn't know that. Only Ultimate. Okay. I have Ultimate. Oh, okay, I'm not going to do it. because It's not going to work for sure if I do a demo. Okay, so we're going to do a, what, Toronto, Toronto Jog Artifact IDE. Now dependencies, because they give them for free, I'm going to add some, actuator. Let's add Zipkin, so Zipkin client. Uh, what else I can add? Ah, it's enough, because, yeah. And now I click generate project. And a zip is downloaded called Toronto Jug. And since I love terminals, I'm going to go to repo presentations, okay. 
I have a working thing already here. If I fail, I think it's working. So I'm going to copy the Toronto jog zip over here, and I'm going to unzip it. OK. And I'm going to open the project. Repo. Uh, presentations, Toronto jog, home. Open this project, this window. Well, resolving dependencies, hopefully, yeah, they will, yeah, okay. What do we have here? We have a freshly created project with artifact ID Toronto Jug. I'm using the fresh Dalston SR1. I have the dependencies added, like the, the release train dependency management. And I have the starter Zipkin here. That's cool. So I don't have to do much. OK. I have some tests. But we're not going to write tests, are we, right? Who's writing tests? So I'm going to start with writing a controller. Toronto controller, which is a REST controller. Oh, Spring MVC would be nice to have, right? I knew it. Spring Boot Starter Web, I guess. Yeah. Rest control. Makes more sense. Who is doing field injection in their classes? You know how many unicorns have just died or like puppies because of every single field injection you're doing? You should always be doing injection via constructor. Doing field injection is an anti-pattern. And yeah, you should stop. Like You should refactor the whole code tomorrow to do the, the, the constructor injection. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't have to do anything. So I'm going to do a get mapping. <laughs> if that's the case, that's a perfect reason not to do it. So I'm going to do what? Toronto. Get mapping with Toronto. Uh, OK. And now I am going to do something like this. That uh, I'm going to call the REST template in such a way that I'm going to get for object to HTTP localhost 8081, I think. And I'm going to return a string. So this is my response. And now I'm going to return Toronto plus response. Why not? Right? So in theory, I get a request to the Toronto endpoint, and I'm sending another request to uh, this first service, right? So now what I need, because it's not going to work, is to create a bean of type REST template. Return new REST template. What I also need is to name this app Spring Application Name Toronto. Let it, let it be. Sleuth. No, how was it? Spring? Some percentage? Spring, I don't remember. I have to check it out. Uh, sampler, no, sleuth. Hmm, where's my sleuth? That's interesting. Yeah, but I, do I even have it? Has, has something changed? Spring. Boot? Where are my cloud stuff? It should, otherwise it makes no sense. Start a sleuth. Okay. Maybe I maybe I changed something and I don't remember. Uh okay. That doesn't look good, does it? I told you that something's not gonna work. Toronto Jack, dependencies. What? Unknown. 
Uh, my life is miserable. Spring got started. Dependencies are here. Is there something wrong with the internet? Forbidden. This looks interesting. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna use snapshots because I should have them. The snapshots. So as always, there's a problem with artifacture or my internet. Why is it forbidden? Oh, I know why. Okay, I have, yeah. Okay, I know, I'm sorry. It's from the workshops. So, yeah. <laughs> sorry about that. Turn on to jug. So now we should do SR1 over here. Yeah, remove this guy and refresh. Now we're talking. Sorry. So I need sleuth. Oh, thank God. Spring sleuth. <laughs> sampler. Where is sampler? Percentage. And I need one zero. Because I want to sample everything. Oh, and port would be useful. Server port. Let's do 9994. Why not? Okay, so most likely that's it. So as you can see, oh, and uh, you should start doing also package scope of everything. Then your life is going to be easier when you try to refactor stuff. Anyways, uh, I'm running this. And let's see what happens. As you can see, I've just added sleuth. I didn't do anything else, right? No sleuth specific code has been added. The first thing you're going to see is that my call for logs have started to have my app name. So the logging pattern has changed. Now, if I go to localhost 9994, Toronto. Yay, I got something, it's working. So if right now I go to Zipkin, what was the address? Somebody remembers address of Zipkin? Shit, I've forgotten. This is so embarrassing. 9411, okay. 9411. There you go. So what we have is, this is the UI of Zipkin. Uh, you will nice now see how lazy I am because the sketched graph of dependencies that you've seen in the slides comes from Zipkin. I was still even lazy to sketch it myself. So in Zipkin, like imagine that this is production. So Zipkin tells you how your, uh, let's say, world looks like on production. Because this is post factum, it happened already. So if I click here, like over one day, Service 2 was, for example, used service 3 three times. That's why this, this uh, arrow is thicker than the rest, right? And here's our Toronto service. So let's check it out, find a trace. Let's find some traces. And suddenly, you can see quite a few things here. Um, so let's start with our Toronto service. Should be somewhere around here. Okay, it's here. If we click that, we can see that we had our Toronto endpoint called first, then Toronto called service one, service one called two, etc. Now, if we click here, we will see some interesting information. So these are logs, and these are tags. So you can see that an annotation called server receive happened at relative time of one millisecond, and server send after one second. And we know that the Toronto controller with a method Toronto processed that, this request. It's kind of nice. Let's go here. Now it's even cooler because we have the RPC scenario, right? So we have client sent, server received. So you can calculate the latency over here. You can calculate the latency over here if you want to. And we have a lot of interesting information. So the host was localhost, the method was get, the path was start. So the whole URL was this. Uh, and there was service one controller with a method start. 
So that's kind of like helpful. Uh, yeah, and the rest you've already seen. So it's like well, over one second for the whole processing. Uh, over here we had uh, also the RPC call between service two and service three. So it gives you a lot of information and you like, Imagine that you have a very complex system and somebody, somebody joins your, uh, your team without knowing what the hell is going in your system. They immediately can see, oh, why this bar is so long? Something is wrong, I guess. For example, I know why this bar is so long because I put a sleep over there, right? Uh, but like, immediately you know that something's not, not really properly done. Okay, and now I will try to play a little bit with um, with Sleuth. So let's say that we're going to create a, I don't know, REST template service. I don't have an, I'm too tired for a better name. Let's call it, let's make it a component. Let's inject the uh, REST template over here. Okay, and now we're going to do this method like call service one, whatever. I'm going to copy this code, okay, from here, and I'm going to uh, do a new span annotation. And I don't remember what it takes. It has a oh, it has a it has a name. So let's let's add some names here. Uh, so let's call the span. I don't know. Service one. No, calling service one. Why not? Uh, yeah, and that, that's, let's keep it simple. Because you can do a lot of stuff with Sleuth. Hopefully this will work. And it's going to be enough for a show off. REST, template service. Okay. This REST template service. And we're going to just do, oops, return. Something like this. So if I, if I didn't do anything wrong, and most likely I have, then we should have a new span created by Sleuth in, a, like a, in an easy way. So I'm going to call, oh no, this one, sorry, this one, Toronto. I'm calling it again. Okay, and now if I go back to Zipkin, I should have more interesting stuff. Uh, newest first, so this, this is this guy, oof, it works. So here we have calling service one. So this is how you can create your custom, custom stuff. Uh, one more thing that we can search for, uh, or I, I can show you, is that, I mean, obviously you can your, create your custom tags, custom events, uh, but it like, doesn't have to be really interesting for you. But what we can do is to show you, I mean, I can show you, What's the reason behind, um, behind tags as such? So I, you've seen that I have quite a few traces already. And let's say I want to filter some out because I'm interested only in a subset of those. Let's say that you're doing a trading application. And for some reason, whenever you buy, I don't know, Oracle's uh, trades, the system is slow, like in real life. Then you want to find only those traces that correspond to Oracle. So what you can do, like if I go here, I will see that I have a, uh, for example, MVC controller method called Toronto. So if I go back here to find the trace, I have something over here to search. So I can do something like this, and I didn't find anything because I did something wrong. Okay, that was embarrassing. So in general, you can search over here. <laughs> I'm trying to maybe search for something else. Uh, maybe the dots are misleading. Yeah, so I can, yeah, believe me, you can do it. Uh, demo gods, typically, but actually this is bizarre because it should work. And if I do it like this, oh yeah, I think I should do it like this. I think, Toronto, oh, okay. Right, so it shows, yeah, because um, you're searching for all services that have this particular uh, entry inside the uh, inside the uh, a particular tag. 
So, like, uh, I'm gonna, like, like, you can access the Zipkin that has been deployed to our Pivotal web services, so the cloud. And over there, there is like a gigantic example, uh, Docs Brewing, for a beer brewing app. That's, like I said, it's really, really gigantic. It's 117 spans. It looks like this. Why is it like a sp space here? Because I'm calling it twice, and I'm deliberately waiting for some time to, uh, let's say, exercise some things. So this like reminds more of your production systems. So if you go to the dependency section, you'll see how nice it looks and how the reality is like terrible. And here, I can find a trace that has, oh, so this, if you have a dot like this, it means that you have a custom tag, uh, sorry, a custom event. So I have created an event called ingredients aggregation started that happened under, like in certain time. So if you have notable events in, your, in uh, the lifetime of your span, you can easily track them by other dots in a trace. And there was also the, the, uh, the tag that was more intelligent, I think it was beer equals stout, but maybe, yeah, okay, so this, this is kind of a beer that has the stout tag somewhere, somewhere inside, right? Uh, okay, one more thing I'm gonna show you with Zipkin, because you could have said, like noticed, that there is this, oh, sorry, this is not Toronto, so this one. What is this red thing, right? So if you click here, you will see that this is the trace that was created for this exception thing, this, this problematic one. So you click here, you will see the red thing, the errors that were found during you know, uh, the flow of the message. For example, you can find that an error read timeout has happened at the endpoint called blow up. Makes sense, right? So if you go, for example, here, you will see 500 nil, so it is less interesting. And over here you can find, like, for example, exactly the reason for the exception. So immediately you can also find, whoa, there was an exception thrown over there, right? Okay, so it, it wasn't really that bad, I guess. The demo worked. Yeah, so these are uh, the screens as if the demo would fail. So here you had first request, then service one calling two, two calling three, and two calling four. Here you could see events, so certain things that happen in time. For an RPC call, you have those four. And here you could have tags, so key value pairs. And for an error, you could see that if you click here, whoops, click here, you have uh, an exception uh, shown over here. How do you set a baggage? That's fairly easy because you can use the tracer interface from Sleuth, and you set the baggage item with a key value, as simple as that. If you set it on one service, then it's passed further on. And to retrieve the baggage, item, uh, baggage you do get baggage item with a key, and then if the, if the thing was set, then, then you get the value. If not, you get a null. So this is new with 1 to 0. You can do new span, which I've shown you. And also, you can provide a value, like a, you can annotate the, um, the, the parameter of the method to provide tags at runtime. So for example, a very good use case is to annotate Spring Data, the interfaces from Spring Data, and then automatically out of the box, you get all tracing information with tags for the methods of Spring Data, which is kind of cool. And you can, uh, you can you start a new span or you can continue a span. Actually, you should have a very good reason to start a new span. You should always try to continue spans, because span like is a certain important operation that happens. If you have a certain flow and certain things that happen inside this flow, you can always put tags and events, like log events. If there's something like notable that you would like to know how long this particular thing took, you should wrap it in a span. So summary. Uh, first thing is you should always check your settings XML before doing a demo. Uh, log correlation allows you to match logs for a given trace, which is very important, in a, especially in a distributed um, system. With distributed tracing, you can quickly see latency issues in your system. 
Zipkin is a very nice tool uh, that allows you to visualize latency graph and system dependencies, or you can always use PCF metrics from us. Uh, that also allows you, like both, uh, shows you the graph of calls and correlates that automatically with logs. So you can see both at the same time, which is very useful. Sprinkler Sleuth integrates with Zipkin and grants you a lot correlation out of the box. And from one to you can use baggage, which is kind of cool. And you can use annotations to create continuous spans, but still you can use Tracer API to create spans manually. But if you create manually, remember to always close the span. Now Zipkin for Brewery, I've shown you that already. So in Spring Cloud, even though I'm a end-to-end -end test hater, uh, about the reasons for that, you can uh, listen to me speaking at a webinar on the 30th of, of May. So we go to content.pivotal.io slash webinars, I think, and register for the webinar. I was told that 300, no, 400 people have already registered, so that's crazy. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about sprinkled pipelines, continuous delivery deployment, and why I hate end-to-end -end tests. And I suggest that you don't use them. I mean, of course, I'm joking that you shouldn't be using them because maybe in your companies it makes sense. In my opinion, uh, like if you have certain scale of apps, it's impossible to maintain the environments. We can talk about this over the beer. So basically, uh, I'm a, a hypocrite because I do end-to-end -end tests for Spring Cloud. But yeah, over the beer, I'll explain why. Here's the source code. So there's plenty of apps over there, about 10 apps with Spring Cloud infrastructure as well. Uh, yeah, 10 apps. And it's deployed, as I've shown you. The Zipkin is deployed to PCF, so you can play around with Zipkin. You can click around, see how it looks like, without uh, even running it on your local machine. This is how the brewery looks like. This is how the whole flow looks like, so it doesn't even fit in the screen. And now time for questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. And these are the links. So since I'm an automation freak, the whole presentation uh, in terms of the Elasticsearch log slash Kibana box, all the apps, are there in GitHub. It's enough for you to run Get Ready for Conference. And it will start Vagrant. It will start Kibana, Elasticsearch, and Logstash inside Vagrant. It will start four apps. It will start Zipkin. It will curl a good request. It will curl a request to make an exception. And then you can go to the Kibana and check out the logs and check out Zipkin. The sleuth samples are uh, over here. The documentation, yeah. I mean, it's written there, so time for questions. Sure, no problem. Go ahead. So you said with Sleuth, you're only you can configure how many, uh, what, what percent of requests within the zip kit, right? Is it possible if you knew a certain time range to replay your logs? Like, I assume Sleuth is also logging. Sleuth, Sleuth also uh, only changes the logging pattern. Replay back. Uh, so, uh, so, assuming that you have the logs, you would like to send the, from the logs, send them to Zipkin? Yeah. Um, no, 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 because you would have to, in the logs, like dump all the information from a span. So, uh, start time, stop time of the span, e uh, logs, and tags. So, basically, you would have to dump the span. If you do that, yes, but it makes little sense. Any more questions? Yeah, go ahead. Baggage will cross the trace or just across the span? Uh, no, no, I mean, it makes no sense for the baggage to be around the span. Across the whole trace. So the trace. if we have a like, system com comprising of microservices, every one of you is a microservice, and the call is like this. So if I set a baggage, people at the end will get the baggage. Oh, another question. Can I drop this into a JE? Oh, Jesus. I mean, okay. This is, no, no, sorry. This is a very, very good question. So, in order to use Zipkin, you have to follow a certain standard of uh, putting headers, of like, propagating tracing context. So, there are libraries that are compatible with Zipkin for different languages. So, maybe there is one for enterprise apps as well. If there is one that takes care of uh, instrumenting everything inside your app, because this is like the key thing, not only passing like the headers. You have to pass the tracing information between threads, thread locals, executor ser service, scheduled executor service, 
everything service, then if, if the library does that, no problem. Any more questions? Go ahead. We are using PWS with PCF metrics, but we can see the traces. And the question is? Why? You can't see the traces? Yeah. In PCF oh, yeah. metrics? How should I know? I mean, I, should, I would have to see your uh, case. I don't know. So in the logs, do you have the? So in the logs, we can see like the little icons, and we can see only one request um, from one service, but we cannot see all the services. And the logs are properly uh, like the logging. The logs contain the tracing information. Yeah. So I have no idea. I'm not working on the PCF metrics. I have no idea. It should work. It works on my machine. That's my answer. <laughs> Yes, this is the well-documented SIPKIN compatible format. And is, is there, is it strictly Spring, is there other language? No, no, this is ZIPKIN related, and ZIPKIN is language agnostic, so to say. So there are, like I said, so there are tracers, because these are called tracers, for Go, PHP, we can go to this. Uh, I just found one for You see? Uh, there's this initiative called Open Tracing, where they try to, um, be like vendor neutral in terms of, yeah, I mean, in general, there is an interface that you should implement. It has nothing to do actually with the headers, so it's not that really, that, because the idea of this is that you have an interface that everybody implements and like for different languages and everything works fine. But that's not true because it's just an interface. You can implement any sort of BS you want. So um, we can take a look at, yeah, like Zipkin tracers maybe. Uh, so we have Zipkin Ruby, for instance. Let's check out the open Zipkin thing. Zipkin Ruby, Azure, uh, JS, Java, Spark, Go, Finego, C Sharp. Oh, nice. Oh, now the baggage is interesting because uh, there is no, no uh, standard for the baggage. So for example, in Sleuth, we are doing this like a poor man's version. So we are just passing headers with a baggage prefix, x, da, x slash baggage. So whatever, so if you have a Postman like app, you can send to the first service the uh, like tracing information plus the header x dash baggage and we're gonna pick it up and continue. But another tracing, like another tracer might do it in a different way because there's no standard for baggage. But for the rest, there is. This bare minimum, like you showed us the bare minimum type of settings. So essentially in the Zipkin, the only thing was there in the form.xml, right? Yeah. No, I have only Zipkin because Zipkin takes Sleuth. Oh, okay, okay. You have only, uh, only the starter for Zipkin yeah. because you need Sleuth for log correlation. And in the Zipkin, correlation. Zipkin module, you have any other Java code other than these? I mean, I, I haven't shown you the Zipkin like code, right? Basically, if you. I mean, you... I mean uh, apart from the starting of the application, that is standard, basically. Ah, uh, no, I did nothing. So on the Zipkin side, you need to configure the backend. So I, I, I've done an in-memory one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Default one. That's yeah, right. but you can change yeah, to Cassandra or something else. I'm trying to understand the bare minimum. Tomorrow I can... Ah, so for the demo, you do... You go to open Zipkin, Zipkin. Where is it? Zipkin, Zipkin. Yeah, oh. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. So you go to open Zipkin, Zipkin. And here, you have a wget to download the fat jar. And you do Java jar, that's it. So for like to show off a demo, download the jar, and that's it. Any more questions? Okay, so if there, no, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. No problem. How is, how is Splunk uh, different from, like, so we use Splunk. Like Splunk is an uh, like equivalent to Elasticsearch log slash Kibana. So this part. So log, let's say, parsing and presenting. There's nothing to do actually with Zipkin, at least I, not that I know of. So I've shown you an open source ELK thing, so Elasticsearch Log Slash Kibana, and for Splunk you have to pay billions of trillions from what I know, right? 
Yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. So that's the main difference. So instead of elk, you could have used Splunk. That's it. Any more questions? Don't be shy. Once again, isn't it a like in, in, uh, another instrumentation library or? S ah, okay. So this is a, okay. So this is something different, or New Relic, right? So the, okay. So this is something different because with New Relic you're instrumenting, as far as I remember, with an agent, right? So you have an agent running that instruments your code, and it can give you gigantic granularity of information about uh, like latency, but in, even on method calls, right? Yeah. And not always you need that because you're interested in the latency of the whole system and of the flow of messages. So this is something different. Yeah. So for example, the thing that you showed is span, span and uh, trace. Yes. Right? So similarly, Brian Dynatrace provides what they call pure path. Okay. And they, what they call transaction correlation, basically. Okay. So it goes to the different tier. So maybe maybe it's the same. I don't yeah, oh, sorry. So I don't know. Sort of uh, okay. so even though they, they claim some places it might be breaking down basically. Okay, but uh, isn't it like this that uh, it's a Java agent? Yeah. And yeah. so if you have an old JS app, you're screwed, yeah. right? It is, it is somehow tied to the JMX basically. They take advantage of the JMX hooks that is already there in, in Java. Oh, okay. I see. Oh, okay. So basically, with open tracing initiative or or with uh, Zipkin compatible. Uh, tracers, you can use a lot of different languages and it's going to work, right? Because every language will produce spans and send it to Zipkin and Zipkin understands that. Uh, yeah, and basically here you, you can, you're, you're locked actually to a specific vendor, so to say. Uh, and uh, like, it, like it, it's, it's kind of a different, because you, like a different thing, because you can only do it for the JVM apps and here you can like, do it for the whole system. <laughs> Oh, okay. I didn't know that. So I'm. I, I'm also, their agent might do anything to your bytecode. So all of your customer data is in various clouds in Donald Trump land. <laughs> because you send it uh, to the cloud, right? Yeah. Well, it's the only I way mean, in theory, theory, you could. could. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. 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 But, um, That's true. That's true. But it does work across various languages. Okay. So I didn't know if that. If your Java app calls Node apps, they call Go apps. It will actually trace it. Through. Okay. Similarly with headers. Okay. I was just wondering, like you talked about not killing your system server by sending every single request, right? Like, what's the overhead on your actual? Like, I guess it's a sleuth. On the instrumentation. Yeah, like so we're doing benchmarking, but you know, it's kind of difficult to go, to do proper benchmarking because we'd have to have dedicated servers somewhere in a cellar or something. So it's not big. Uh, I would have to search because we have a running job every day. I would say that it's like, I don't know, at most 10 milliseconds, at most, like in worst case scenario, but it's a couple of milliseconds. Oh no! Oh, you're you're saying only sending to to zip to zip. Yeah, yeah. It's a sync, so it's not it's not there's no latency whatsoever because it's in a separate thread asynchronously. I'm talking about Sleuth as such because there's always some latency in terms of instrumentation. So 10, I, no, I exaggerated with 10 milliseconds. It's I don't know after five, I'd say. So it's, we're really trying to make it minimal. Sometimes, you, I mean, you can't do much. There's going to be some latency. But uh, as far as we're doing different benchmarks, one is with JMH. Uh, so we're running benchmarks for an hour or so and see you know, what the result is. And the other is with JMeter, like uh, let's say end-to-end yeah, -end one. So we're shooting requests for half an hour to the the app with a controller that sends another app uh, message to another app, and the and the results are really neglectable. So at least for now, we're not doing harm to your latency. Any more questions? Any more questions? So there are no questions. Thank you very much.